Welcome to this webinar by Citizen Matters Mumbai. Uh, first, a quick introduction to Citizen Matters for those who are joining us for the first time and also the viewers on our Facebook Live. Citizen Matters is a civic media platform that looks at critical urban issues, ideas, and solutions for better cities. We deep dive into issues that affect our quality of life, including water, commute, public safety, air quality, governance, education, environmental, local, and economy, local economy, and more. Our work has made a difference on the ground in getting more people involved and in catalyzing change. And also, this includes some of our speakers today, people like you who have uh, helped us make a difference on ground. Citizen Matters is supported by Urvani Foundation, a nonprofit trust. Our other initiatives are opencity.in. It's an open data platform. Also, India Together, which is a developmental journal. At present, Citizen Matters has three dedicated chapters in Bengaluru, Chennai, and Mumbai. And we publish articles related to policy and practice relevant to cities across India. Our Mumbai chapter is the newest, which launched in July 2020 amidst the constraints of COVID-19. Our work is defined by a collaborative model. So we work with professional journalists, with experts, uh, practitioners, and citizen contributors who share stories with us. So do check, check us online and on our social media. And I will now hand over to Radha to take the discussion forward. Good evening, everyone. I would like to thank all of you for joining today's panel discussion on the state of urban planning in Mumbai. Uh, over time, Citizen Matters has published a range of stories on infrastructure, environment, and health in Mumbai that cover developmental projects, public spaces, and public health system. Uh, from our research, we have been able to identify gaps in urban planning in Mumbai and how it has overlooked and potentially contributed to a glaring class divide. Informal settlements where 55% of the city's population lives have routinely been excluded from access to basic services. In today's panel discussion, we will discuss and question shortfalls in Mumbai's infrastructure, environmental and socio-economic planning towards understanding where the city currently stands in these areas and how we can move forward from here. I would now like to hand over the discussion to Minakshi Ramesh, uh, co-founder of Citizen Matters and the moderator for this session. Over to you, Minakshi. Thank you, Radha. Thank you very much. Uh, a very warm welcome to all our uh, panelists this evening. Uh, I put my hand up to be the moderator for this discussion because as they say, you may go live anywhere else in the country after you've lived in Mumbai, but a piece of your heart always lives in Mumbai. So, uh, you know, as I wrote to you, uh, I lived in Mumbai for almost 24 years over two stints and then some places still have fond memories and associations. So uh, it's very hard to take the Mumbai out of you. And then at the same time, some things are so exasperating. Like you come to Mumbai now, you only bond with the taxi driver. You don't bond with your friends that you came to meet. or He's the only guy that you're having quality conversations with if you take a cab. So really, I think uh, this is a great opportunity for us to help our readers and our audience understand what are the challenges and the limitations of trying to plan for a dynamic, complex city like Mumbai. I will very briefly introduce our panelists, just a line about each of you. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, my colleague um, will be live tweeting, Aruna will be live tweeting and she will be sharing your detailed bios for all our um, uh, participants who are on the call. Uh, I will we have with us Professor Akta Chauhan, an architect, urban planner, and educator. He's the former director of Rizvi College of Architecture and founder president of the International Association for Humane Habitat. We have with us Aslam Sayed, a visual culture, ecological anthropologist, and documentarian. Thank you for teaching me a new word today, Aslam. Very deeply interested in issues related to riparian and local communities that are uh, in, the, in the cities. He's also the founder of Halu Halu, an initiative that introduces Mumbaikers to various communities and cultures around the city. We have with us Rajit Matthews, Program Director of Urban Development at WRI. She's been associated with them for over nine years. Current work includes spatial economic planning, integration of land use and transport. She also told us how she's 
in experienced in sort of understanding the travails of urban planning, not just of Mumbai, but across the country. So I'm hoping to draw on that learning today. We have with us Burgess Driver. He's an urban planner, associate member of the Institute of Town Planners India, a COA registered architect and an accredited professional on the Indian Green Building Council. His interests are primarily related to environment, governance, uh, land and water management. And we have with us Prachi Merchant. Prachi is an urban planner who's worked with the MCGM towards setting up the Mumbai Parking Authority. She's part of the Mumbai Commission for Art, Music and Culture. She's been appointed a member of the advisory committee for gender on gender for MCGM. And we're, we're very eagerly looking forward to all your inputs. Thank you very much. The format that I'd like to follow is to, I'll, I'll, I have some questions which I've kind of run by each one of you, the topic that I'd like you to touch upon. And then we'll be, we'll be waiting to pick up uh, on topics that you might have said something and that touches off a thread or a thought in somebody and then we'll just go around uh, a couple of times. So I hope that's okay with you. I'd like to start with you, Rajit. Uh, urban planning, is it an in the context of our cities, is it an oxymoron? Is it even possible to plan for the kind of cities that we seem to live in? What are the challenges? You, you talked about uh, outdated legislation, improper planning. I'd love for you to throw some light on whether the concept per se uh, is, not, uh, is not the way it should be. Please, please uh, help us understand. Um, what I actually wanted to, you know, bring to the table is that our urban planning has not caught up to the complexities that our cities face today. That is the biggest challenge. Most town country planning acts which determine how you do planning across cities, and this is, I'm talking at an India scale, not just Mumbai, but Mumbai in particular as well. Um, there's the Bo Bombay Town Planning Act of 1915. That was sort of the basis of how different town planning acts came about, including the MRTP in 1966. The problem with the planning legislation is it is largely land use based. So, you know, when you do master plans for cities, there are colors of red, blue, green, yellow that you assign in terms of residential, commercial, etc. But the integration of projects is the problem. For example, the Metro Rail Authority can come and decide where the alignments of the Metro Rail are. It did not talk to the land use plan very often an afterthought that just pasted on. You know, how many of our cities today, you see the road in front of your house is dug up uh, to put up a water line. And the moment it's all put back in place, the power supply department comes in or somebody else comes in. So it's a constant, you know, mismatch of priorities, mismatch of, you know, projects coming in, no integration happening. And that's sort of the bane uh, of planning in India. We don't have enough integration across departments. And you have municipal agencies, you have parastatals at the state level, many of them are land owning and you know, with, with great powers uh, to come and act on the city space. So the integration is the big problem. Another problem with our legislation is we are currently dependent on legislation that is 50, 60 years old. Our cities have moved far beyond that today in terms of complexity. The legislation was made when the cities were much smaller cities. Today our cities are one crore people, like Delhi is 1.8 crore people. Mumbai is also uh, crossed a crore. So uh, how do you then plan for them? The other point is a lot of this is dated legislation that we've taken on from colonial times. But if you go to a London today or a UK today, their legislation has evolved greatly from there. They've done consistently gone ahead with many modifications to make their planning relevant to their cities today. So a London city, for example, and I just give an example of the difference in the way planning is done. It not only does a spatial plan, the city of London, of course, there's a difference in the way, you know, governance operates in other cities. We know, you know, London is run by a mayor, uh, for example. So the mayor of London anchors a strategic spatial plan. Along with that spatial strategy, he has a transport strategy, an environment strategy, and an economic strategy. And it is his job to make sure that all of these are integrated with each other. Uh, and he can be actually uh, pulled up if he does not manage the integration. That kind of negotiation between departments does not happen in our context. We don't have negotiated planning between departments and you know, sort of the citizen participation that happens in other contexts. I'll stop there, thank you. 
So now I'll come back to you on that uh, very key point that we're actually trying to get some inputs across cities is, will really our cities have a future unless we have a powerful and answerable mayor at the helm? Like how there is the mayor of Beijing or the mayor of Shanghai or the mayor of New York or the mayor of London. And in our cases, it's, it's mostly just a, a figurehead, right? Just to tick the box, certain community, certain gender will be the mayor. So thank you for that. I'll come back to you on that. I've, I've made a note of how you've said we are struggling to, to, uh, to hold on to, uh, you know, old, understand how do we handle old laws, etc. I want to ask Professor Chauhan, uh, in his uh, experience, I want to ask um, public health infrastructure is one of the most visible aspects to a common man of what the city stands for and how the city provides for people that come to live in it. Uh, why do you think Mumbai's public health infrastructure is in such bad shape, sir? Well, thank you for inviting me on this panel. Uh, the concern for health has to begin uh, in the overall uh, kind of uh, health policy and the social policies. Uh, it cannot just act uh, within the narrow limits of uh, scope uh, for the municipal corporation as such. This is my belief. And I think most of our planning uh, problems uh, start with uh, this, the kind of uh, governance structure that we have adopted and we have not modified with our experience. So there is a kind of a neglect of uh, the poorest of the poor in our national policies and our state policies. And as a result, the kind of uh, scope which is available is much more restricted. According to me, we should have pursued a goal of healthcare for all right from our independence. At the city level, if we pursue a goal like this, we would be required to provide a complete network of health services and facilities to reach out uh, to the poor of the poor. That would mean that we would require more doctors in public hospitals there will be more public uh, hospitals and clinics and uh, diagnostics, and there would be more uh, a kind of a space available for developing this infrastructure. There will be more funds available for this. And somebody will have to be accounted for its proper uh, conduct and its proper integration. We don't have this. We have not adopted such a goal. So there have been some uh, here and there kind of uh, policies, like there is a policy for say industrial worker and there are some insurance scheme and then there are some facilities developed for that. But it doesn't cover everyone in the city. Because as you pointed out in your opening remarks, 55% of the people are living in slums and they are totally neglected in our uh, planning process. So first of all, we need to begin with our social policies. So we need health for all, we need education for all, and we need work for all to really even think of planning. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, you know, when I'm hearing you, I realize that it's a lofty goal and it is, it is, I was telling Aslam when we started this conversation, do we look at how far we've come or do we look at how far we still have to go? And, you know, either way, it looks a little depressing at this point. Uh, Aslam, may I take this uh, thread to you now? And I'm hearing Professor Chauhan say space. You know, one of the constraints that Mumbai constantly grapples with is because of its unique uh, geography and the fact that it's become so... Uh, defined by its the way shape it is and the reclamation, et cetera, et cetera. Do you think that could be one of the reasons why development projects have so uh, degraded our, uh, I mean, have also really uh, been very detrimental to our indigenous communities, the people that were original inhabitants of Mumbai, where are their rights? Are we talking about what development means for them? Can you please share your thoughts on that? Can't hear you. Yeah. Yeah. 
so i'm a photographer and uh, i've been shooting uh, indigenous people of mumbai since 5 5 6 years and uh, what has happened to them is first of all they are not uh, they're not part of the any uh, planning or anything or any stuff i'll say sgnp sanjay gandhi national park was uh, like uh, gradually expanded from 20 square kilometer to 100 square kilometer and automatically all the forest dwelling people came into national park in the borders of the national park and suddenly these people who were depending upon the resources from the forest uh, they used to fish farm uh, hunt and everything suddenly they came under the forest act so national park is a part of an urbanization and suddenly these people who have like age old uh, wisdom to to support themselves right suddenly they become part of a uh, urban uh, space and they are not they can't they can't use the resources they can't hunt they can't farm they can't graze the goat and and their uh, age old wisdom is lost and they become unemployed and poor and dependent and sometimes they also called as slum devils devils so i think we are not only we are we all uh, in the in hinterland people we don't understand the coastal geography first we design the city according to our wisdom or our uh, we don't understand see i am coming from deccan somebody is coming from uh, madhya pradesh delhi and uh, so many places but we don't understand the the concept of uh, sea or coast or marine life right so and again uh, if uh, i tell you the north mumbai in uh, north mumbai there are some rivers uh, daisa river poisa river mogra river all they come into a uh, malad creek right and this is i don't know like our uh, like our the planning what sort of planning we have done we don't understand river ins we don't understand uh, nala what nala is basically nala is a, like when there is a heavy rain it's basically it drains out the water from the city but we have converted him into the sewer and all this sewer has polluted the uh, yeah. like malad creek so again this has changed the lifestyle of uh, the coolies who are living at the river they used to fish only in the rivers only in the creek sorry now they they are not adapted to go into the sea and now we want them to go into the sea to fish so basically everything has been we 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 don't consider uh, indigenous people in the part of the design or the plan of the city first of all unka koi bolna hai hi nahi to and i have attending so many this kind of seminar I, i don't believe this kind of anything helps to them and even their participation is there so first of all like so many things are happening online uh, meetings virtual meetings lot of architects they discuss among each other they pay, present papers and on the ground i see nothing is happening so that's what i want to say about it that there is a lot of discussion but you feel like nothing is really happening of course ye sab apne ek dusre ko paper presentation karke ek dusre ko shabash ke dene ka kaam karte hum log i'll say ki main citizen matter ke upar aa gaya i'll post on instagram twitter pe karega people will say wow wow what a work what a good job iske alawa kuch hota nahi hai sorry i'm very really little rude but aisa hi hai ठीक है, we are we are a, we are a platform where we invite you to present your views. Uh, thank you for that. We'll we'll come back to some questions based on what you've said. I'd like to ask uh, uh, Prachi. Uh, you know, I picked up something that I thought was interesting from your introduction, and it was something that I keenly felt identified with in my younger days in Mumbai. Is this notion that Mumbai is a safe city for women? and then i see or safer than other metropolises and then i see that you have used the word uh, plan the gender concept or in your uh, urban planning uh, this thing can you throw some light on what is it to focus on gender in the larger context of urban planning so yeah hello and first of all thanks to citizen matters to invite me here uh, the gender perspective that uh, you've been asked you're asking me is actually related to the development plan of mumbai and i'm sure aslam has a lot of things to revert back on me but uh, I, i have been a part of the uh, planning team uh, as you uh, as a 
I was then with the All India Institute of Local Self Government, and uh, this was for the first time that uh, the citizens uh, uh, formed a group called Hamara Shahar Vikas Abhiyan. I uh, read something about in Citizen Matters too uh, about this group, so I'm sure everyone is aware of and are also a part of it in some way or the other. And uh, what they really did was they made a, a, a you know a very visible loud uh, noise that you know you talk about it and you never implement anything on, in the development plan so uh, when we came in as a team in the mcgm uh, we saw to that that at least you know uh, the issues raised by these different groups need to be heard and they need to be worked upon and what we told them that uh, uh, fine you you can give us advices but what we would really like you to do is be a part of the planning process itself to know how numbers are actually converted into something uh, uh, you know actually on ground so there were five to six uh, gender related uh, amenities actual reservations if you call them in the development plan that were introduced for the first time uh, and this was done so because uh, we realized that the workforce participation of women is quite low in mumbai being at 16% uh, and considering Mumbai, that's quite surprising. Uh, so we thought that, you know, can we at least bring it to a higher level to say 25%? And what do we need to do for that? So when a woman comes to the city for working, uh, she needs to have a place to, uh, uh, you know, live there. She needs to take care of her children. She needs to take care of senior citizens. She needs to, uh, you know, be assured that uh, there is a, a place for her and there are amenities within her vicinity. So through the interactions and through the number crunching, which is actually uh, way, way too ahead uh, of what one needs in a city, but whatever we could kind of introduce, we did introduce a set of social amenities for women in every ward and some in the electoral ward. Electoral ward is a smaller uh, unit of the ward. So, uh, so something called multi-purpose working women's housing is what we introduced. And in fact, one of them, uh, and we later developed a policy on it. And one of them is actually getting implemented in the Peace South Ward. Uh, and it would be one of its uh, first kinds, you know. Second would uh, the child care center where she could safely keep her child. And that was introduced in the neighborhood level, that is the electoral ward level, old age uh, housing. Now these are the amenities which are being taken up by the MCGM for the first time. And it's really, uh, you know, if you look at the law and if you look at the uh, uh, am amendments and everything, you, you realize that, that they are actually not the functions or mandatory or obligatory functions of NCGM. But uh, this was for the first time that we introduced a set of uh, such amenities. And, but I must say there's a long way to go because uh, we, uh, since it's the first time, there are no uh, tried and tested policies on ground. There is, uh, you know, there are too many questions. Who is going to operate it? How is it going to do? MCGM is known for giving amenities, but uh, then what happens to it? Uh, who maintains it? Uh, uh, are we, you know, giving the reservations properly? Is it really inclusive or is it going to be lopsided? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we've made a beginning and uh, there are, uh, uh, you know, at least the wards have been given these amenities uh, systematically. Thank you. Thank you. I am pretty sure that uh, my team at Citizen Matters will probably ch chase it up and go and see how it is. And we'll, we'll share with our readers how the, you know, when it rolls out, how is the uptake in the community and some. But yes, you're right. It is a beginning and uh, everything starts with a beginning. Uh, so thank you for sharing that. Burgess, I would like to ask you, I, uh, I'm particularly picking on the lead Council, uh, the certification uh, point. And I, I want to ask you, I know you have interest in green cover and the, uh, or the lack of it in Mumbai. We very recently published an article about how there is barely one square meter of green cover per person in Mumbai. And that is, uh, I mean, a heart stopping statistic. So where are we heading with our green cover, with our mangroves? Are we, are we even, um, aware or being sensitive to the fact that even while we are trying to catch up with 
the growth as it is now, things have already gone ahead with climate change, the favorite, uh, uh, I mean, you know, it is, it is here, it is real. So what is your view given that even as we get to a goalpost, the goalpost has already shifted? you asked that question and um, I'm going to take this as a very important opportunity to perhaps reinstill some long lost hope in people like Aslam that you know the younger generations that are coming in town planning now they are more concerned about preventing market externalities that have plagued this city they are more focused on inclusive aspects and this is to take that quote from Harrison Ford's famous climate summit that reinforcements are coming. And when reinforcements are coming, they consider these aspects as essential. So when we speak about the matter of Mumbai's environment, over the past 40 years, there's been an absolute disconnect between infrastructure and ecosystem services. So the recognition of the natural values which our land and geography had were not really commonplace back then. But what the city has reflected over time, over these past three centuries, it's a very rich history and legacy of water. And it has also reflected several aspects which spark hope that there can be changes. Now, when I say that, take, for example, our norms right now for how we have you know, planning done, basically. So when um, Minakshi uh, just addressed this aspect of public open spaces, for example, just one square meter per, per person, um, we have to understand where these norms are really originating for. And quite frankly, if we try to assess and substantiate that density-based norms or providing norms on a per capita basis are going to help, they're absolutely not. I think this is a mistake the town planning fraternity has made and is going to heavily realize that in the years to come. So take, a, uh, take the example of public open space. When the WHO standard for nine square meters came, no one questioned the WHO to begin with. This is a norm that tracks back to 1960s or 1970s Italy, which has actually made a case as part of its development regulations back then. Why that norm is relevant in India today in 2021, I will never understand. So we need to explore how these guidelines firstly get made and not just replicate global practices into town planning here. So there is plenty of room, quite frankly, for citizen sciences to make a very big dent uh, in you know, ethical data collection. And our cities are deprived of a lot of data which is required for making decisions related to infrastructure, inclusivity, and making sure that no one is really left behind. So we need to really up our game in terms of how data is collected, how consistently it is collected, and not just for the sake of creating an urban plan. Thick data needs to come in, not just big data. Data which is socially backed by facts and evidence need to come in and needs to be legally recognized now as well. So taking cue from that and taking cue from the entire movements of whatever the climate action plans have considered for the city, a lot of change is going to come. A lot of disruptions are being created by startups also right now in this space, especially in the matters of biodiversity. And we look at tribal communities and the state, basically. We have to understand that there are certain experiments that have been extremely successful and they reinstill faith that yes, you know, perhaps we don't have what committees and that is a gross neglect that we will pay the price for in the years to come. But there are certain success stories that perhaps I can describe as my, in what little experience I've gained now working with an NGO. We kind of piloted our experimental project for creating a register with one of the traditional fishing communities of the city. And you'd be surprised to know that even as a planner, I was mesmerized by the fact that when I created the data sets and helped mobilize the local communities for collecting the information themselves. And this was this entire movement of, you know, just the people there who were interested in taking action for biodiversity and sensitive environmental matters. And who were they? It was a baker, it was a school teacher, it was a social, uh, service uh, representative. It does not really matter if there's a competency in urban to really begin with. And I think that that has been one of the biggest, you know, errors when it comes to planning is that we really underestimate the value of what data someone brings to the table. 
So going ahead with the experiment was actually quite successful and we managed to get hold of very impactful data from over 70 to 100 uh, individuals just in one small village. And these were self-motivated interests. So there's quite a lot of practical legroom for citizen sciences and data to take over and perhaps better guide these plans, better guide the inclusive aspect of planning and taking it ahead from there. So urban transparency, ethics, and how information is communicated for climate action. You know, there's a lot of negativity surrounding the possible impacts of what might happen here in Mumbai. But if you dial down the volume of all the media articles and relevant, you know, misinformation that gets spread around, there are certain facts and evidences that have come to light. So take a C-step study that was done recently for Maharashtra's vulnerability to uh, climate effects. And uh, a C-step study has recently estimated that District Mumbai and Mumbai Suburban will in the near term, that is 2021 to 2050, experience extremely high bouts of rainfall. Summer maximum and winter minimum temperatures will increase in the range of one to two degrees Celsius. And there will be more rainfall days. And like I said, heavy rainfall events will keep increasing mm. as compared to the historical period of 1990 to 2019. Now, this is an incredibly important opportunity for urban designers and urban planners to re-explore the relationships of infrastructure and environment in this city. When I say that, it is for inclusive outcomes of those who are the most disparaged in the city, which are our tribal communities. So when we do work like this, when we think of it at a scale, we should not really be prioritizing certain stakeholders or others. It is important to understand the needs of the entire pool and not just adjust yeah. ourselves to a certain segment. So in this case, it was purely market interests that have created so many externalities that are almost eliminating the livelihood opportunities of the disparaged in the city. So when we actually talk about inclusive outcomes, there are certain considerations like these that should be taken into account by our designers of the urban planning fraternity, that when you do propose certain solutions in straight design, that when you do propose certain solutions in land use planning, plot adjustments, whatever it is, the outcomes have to be of a scale that is appreciable by a larger audience and right. greater right. beneficiaries. Yeah. So WSADS, which is the sustainable urban design or water sensitive urban design, should become the modus operandi for any future ventures in this city. Percolation needs to be increased and yeah. it is already being done by citizen machinery right now. So there are a lot of promising strides that are being taken. Everything is not absolutely as negative as it should sound or appear at face value. A lot of steps are being taken. And if the current government is in fact very interested in carrying ahead the idea of co-governance, then citizen sciences and involvement have to be absolutely paramount. And I think these are directions that have to be taken ahead. Yeah, we would love to be, to connect with you offline on the whole data project because one of the things that the Urvani, our parent foundation, wants to do is actually be a repository of urban information, just which is supposed to be free and available to every citizen to understand the various parameters. So I'd love to connect with you offline on that. Thank you so much for shining the light on the importance of having not just big data, but thick data, right? Isn't that what you said? Yes, data that makes sense. Yes. So thank you for that, Burgess. I want to circle back to Rajit now. Rajit, I want to, I know you have worked in affordable housing and really I don't know what to say except to hear what do you think holds back Mumbai from even considering or getting off? Like, you know, how people talk anecdotally about how you come into big cities across the world and you see skyline, etc. When you come into land in Mumbai, you see miles and miles of blue top. Why is that? And when will that ever change? Will that ever change? Okay, Manakshi. Um, I think the first thing to recognize is that a city like Mumbai has predominantly an informal workforce. And it's true of most of our big cities, right? The informal workforce is very high. Um, what happens with that? I mean, so, you know, it, in fact, uh, a lot of solutions were discussed right now, but a lot of solutions lie with us as well. And I'll give an example. Um, if we have a household help, say a cook, who's coming in to cook for us, uh, she might charge us about say 6,000 rupees to make say breakfast and lunch. Um, if the same person asks for, say, 10,000 the next year or 15,000 the year after that, 
uh, what would a typical household do? They would just replace her with somebody else who is willing to basic, uh, who is willing to work at six thousand rupees. So there is no wage progression. Uh, it's a very slow wage progression in the informal sector. Um, now, unless they have better access to money, how will they improve their living conditions? Um, so, say this household of this cook and her her family are looking to buy a house. What is the cost of housing in Mumbai today? I'm talking about a formal house, not a blue tarp house. Um, it is minimum one crore, right, to get a house in Mumbai. Now, how will the informal sector afford this? So, a household like that cannot move into formal housing anytime soon. They basically have, you know, two or three choices. One is to move into the informal housing sector that's available, which is, you know, sort of what is below what you would say legal, uh, you know, legislation or regulation um, below a certain cost and hence, you know, below certain standards of getting basic amenities or else they have to move out really far um, to the periphery, move at least 60 to 90 kilometers away from the heart of Mumbai where you can afford a house that, that comes within your budget. So these are the kind of issues uh, that our city faces, a city like Mumbai. Uh, the other thing is, of course, we have to recognize land prices are extremely high. Um, a land price in Mumbai is equal to New York. So anything you build on it is going to be expensive. So accommodating, you know, affordable housing is going to be extreme. It's a very difficult problem uh, to solve. You know, wages are not increasing. Land prices are escalating. And it's not even like a shortage of housing. There's a huge oversupply of housing in Mumbai, but not in the affordable segment. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the agencies, I think, uh, estimated the housing uh, oversupply is about two and a half lakh unsold inventory in the high income segment. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's not a shortage, but it is a shortage in a the right side. It's it's not for all. all. Yeah, it's not for all. Um, and, and the other question about affordable housing, when we see, uh, when you're talking about blue top or the uh, you know, slums or the economically weaker section housing, they're very often not in locations uh, which are very stable. For example, uh, it will be on hill slopes, which are prone to landslides. Mm. It will be on, you know, edges of water bodies, which are prone to flooding. So they have extreme vulnerabilities that they face along with, you know, all of the other vulnerabilities of being evicted, of not getting consistent uh, basic services. There are a number of challenges. Uh, where do we go from here? I mean, that's, uh, you know, like I said, these are difficult conundrums. Uh, we have seen some bold and ambitious steps taken in other states. For example, Orissa, uh, through its Jaga mission, is trying to give land rights uh, to slum dwellers. Uh, it's a scheme. I mean, we still have to see how that progresses. Uh, but they are looking to give land rights. So where you stay, uh, you will be entitled to about 30 square meters of land that you can you know, uh, have secure tenure for and then build on it. Um, and I can understand land is really high cost in Mumbai. But even if we recognize, so for example, there's a legal size of housing. If anything is less than 25 square meters in size, it's not considered as legal housing. You know, you're supposed to have a minimum size, uh, but that's not required. You know, many countries, for example, in Vietnam, they recognize housing that is smaller. So you have one room tenements that, you know, a lot of slum dwellers are living in. Why don't you recognize it as legal, at least to provide infrastructure? Um, you don't have to give them security and if that's going to be a much longer political conversation, provide them with basic services so that at least they can live a life of, you know, basic services, hygiene, safety, um, they can at least have better structurally stable housing, you know, all of this can come in just by giving them these services um, right away. Um, so that's something doable. Second is you have schemes like, for example, that is the SRA scheme. Uh, the slum rehabilitation schemes that are there in Mumbai. The problem with that is already the, the slums are extremely dense. Uh, we're hearing about 55%, the, the, in fact, the DP, uh, the development plan talks about 48, 42% of people living in slums in just 8% of the land area of the city. So it's already an extremely dense situation. About half your population is living in like barely one-tenth of the land area. The SRA scheme, you know, because it works in a way of giving a sale component and then giving a rehabilitation component. So you rehouse people in half the percentage of land that they already live in. The rest goes as a, you know, a sale component and how to make up your costs. So they're actually crunched even more into really tall structures that, you know, become very difficult to live in. So these are problems 
uh, that we have to figure out better solutions for um, tenure could be difficult, but something to look at infrastructure definitely why not give it to them and the last solution is even if you're going to move out really far go if you're going 50 60 kilometers away or more ensure public transport is there to come back to jobs right. uh, whether it's better bus systems better train systems come within half an hour or one hour you should be able to reach your job so then you can still live far away in an in a settlement where you can afford things but be able to come to your job and back in a safe transparent, you know, quick uh, and right, safe way, right, yeah, right, yeah, right. convenient way, yeah. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, even with the system creaking at the edges, it's still one of the best public transport systems in the country. So then you can imagine the challenges of even executing, uh, you know, um, programs like this. Prachi, I have, I'll come back to you after I've been to the other panelists. I have something that will probably encompass all of us. Uh, Aslam, I want to ask you, what do you think is a way to bring the voices that uh, you feel are unheard, the, the communities, the coolies, the people, the forest people, what do you think can be done differently? And after we've all spoken, I want to ask Prachi, how do we go from planning to implementation? So I'll let you mull on that, because for us, you represent a voice from the administration. But Aslam, I would like to ask you, how do you think that we can bring those voices forward. I think there is no empathy uh, among the people who are uh, part of uh, decision making. They don't understand the concept of indigenous people or they don't understand people only, first of all. They don't understand ecology of people who, who are living in and around Mumbai from many centuries. Like suppose my friend who is an artist, the Dinesh, he lives in National Park. So his lifestyle is very different if you compare that lifestyle with me. Like he goes in the morning with the goats, he swims in the river, okay? He collects jungle food. So tell me how you're going to incorporate this in your urban design or your city planning, how you're going to do it. We don't understand that. So first of all, we need to get train ourselves, ki what are these cultures, what are these traditions, what are these who are these people who are living from the ages? And suddenly we white collar people come into the city and we start designing the things around how we want it. We want coffee shop, we want a uh, riverfront. These are all fancy things. Uh, mangrove, uh, acres of mangroves, they are, they are the real development. We have to save that, right? Now we uh, like from two in 2005 we heard of uh, like Gorevli, like in north mumbai suburban they want to connect with the gorai but it's not happened that time but now again in 2021 i'm and, uh, like when i yesterday i went to gorai i saw the posters they want like the the political people they want to connect mainland Gorevli to gorai but gorai is again a very beautiful village where they living from the 400 years they have 1810 may first english school dha. Not even Borivli and there is English school, tha, but Gorai mein English school. Tha pehle. They don't want development. They are very happy. The four lane road, if they connect to the village, they have no bigger road in the villages. How they are going to connect to the village? Either they have to uh, like destroy the church or the houses, then it will go through the village. So no, I don't understand. So first of all, the planners should should stay in the villages in the with the indigenous people and understand their thing, then only they can design. I don't say anything like empathy is very important and we lack empathy. Prachi, how do we take voices like these into planning and how do we go from planning to implementation? So it's a very difficult question and uh, so I don't mean to sure. your thoughts. <laughs> And I'm sure we are all okay. taking small steps in this larger journey. We all agree that it's an extraordinarily complex problem. But what do you think? Have you seen some movement on these lines within the administration? See, for us, I'll be very honest with you. Here, I live in Chennai. And here in Chennai, the very first time somebody from the corporation joined one of our seminars, we were very excited because there is this unwillingness to engage with citizen voices, you know. So we're very... Uh, We'd be very happy to hear what uh, take you have on how these voices are even coming into mainstream. How will they be heard? And how do you think we can even take baby steps towards incorporating these into larger plans? 
So what Aslam has been uh, talking about is micro level planning, right? And unfortunately, what we planners do is macro level planning. That's that's my first, uh, uh, you know, response uh, as gap finding. You know, I'm not saying that I have a solution, but I'm trying to understand how we can fill these gaps. So uh, uh, that's one. And yes, we work at a very broader level. And what he is talking about is, uh, uh, you know, uh, ingrained, uh, you know, at a, at a very, very micro level. Uh, if you talk about the DP implementation itself, the implementation percentage has been really poor. Frankly speaking, uh, uh, when till two or three years back, when we had taken a record uh, as for the data, it said that it is from 25 to 30. Five percent only. The implementation is poor. So even if we say that half of your uh, DP, which has been proposed, if it gets implemented, maybe it would make a difference. So the first, uh, it, you know, uh, bug lies there. That can we at least look at how to implement whatever has been proposed? Uh, and uh, uh, in MCGM, there have been efforts uh, for the first time. They budgeted. The implementation uh, after we had proposed it in the report. Uh, however, uh, the implementation cell worked for uh, around two years and it kind of uh, is uh, back to uh, the same things again. It, it definitely needs a separate uh, uh, workforce to look into it because uh, what I see and what every one of us knows about is they are, uh, the, the MCGM employees are so busy with their day-to-day -day work that they don't get into these uh, things which have been you know, uh, put, put, put on their shoulders as uh, you better do this or, you know, as, as they... Second point is, uh, I think we, uh, the participatory planning process, which Aslam has been pointing out, uh, has uh, definitely begun. Uh, and uh, just, just imagine, uh, uh, 20 years back, what the scene may be, maybe uh, Akhtar Chauhan sir can throw some light on that. At least uh, we, uh, we are able to make uh, uh, noise. We are able to pierce inside the system and kind of uh, make the decision makers hear us and uh, actually contribute in doing certain things. And Mumbai is in a better uh, position, I must say. Uh, although the DP and the MRTP Act says that uh, the, uh, the consultation should happen by the end of the process. This was the DP when people said nothing doing. We, we, we want our voices to be heard. We did uh, talk to a lot of uh, uh, fishermen groups also, uh, and uh, we understood what their issues are. But the systemic uh, challenges are so uh, you know, grave that yeah. uh, it, yeah. it, it is... Uh, it is not a single line answer that I'll be able to give Absolutely. you. But for just just for an example, I'll just keep it very short. He mentioned about the fishermen community. Now they all uh, lie. They all are settled for uh, years and years under collector land. There is no survey of that land. There is no uh, authenticity that XXX Cory lives on this uh, uh, parcel of land. And there, this, this is the boundary. So today, if you look at the DP, it's marked as uh, some a patch. Now that is not something that MCGM could do anything about it because the collector has not conducted a survey. So the fisherman uh, community insisted that we at least get that on the map. And then uh, as a compromise, we did mark the boundary and kind of recognize that this is the uh, uh, you know uh, informal housing. This is the Gautan area. Hmm. Uh, so the process is really slow. The process is so. If they are not formally recognized, how do we do anything about it? Anyway, I, I'll leave it. I hear you. I see. hear you loud and clear. Yes, there are huge systemic challenges. But thank you for uh, sharing the what I I would really request Professor Chauhan to take from what you said, Sir uh, Prachi was saying that perhaps with your experience you can tell us how has at least. Somewhat, there have been some changes in taking citizen voices to the uh, planning uh, process and to, to up to MCGM to bring about some change. What has been your experience over the last 15, 20 years? Hello, can you yeah. hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, first of all, let me uh, uh, present my view on some of the 
points which have been raised. I think a lot has been done and a lot is happening in the field of planning and development. Unfortunately, uh, the kind of complexities that we are facing uh, requires much more to be done. But at the same time, we should be honest enough to recognize the contribution of all the professionals who have been involved in this uh, kind of uh, struggle, you know, without much recognition. So right from the days of uh, Patrick Giddies and even before that, uh, the kind of our own uh, homemade uh, planners and architects who are designing cities uh, uh, in our native places like Rajasthan and Gujarat or Saurashtra, uh, which are more livable and which are more uh, in harmony with nature. The point is that uh, the scale of the problem is very, very difficult. And uh, this has been compounded by the kind of political choices that we made and the kind of uh, governance structure we adopted and the kind of uh, uh, transparency that we don't seem to be having. So we started with the idea of uh, developing a very egalitarian society. If you see the Trish with the destiny kind of speech by Nehru and all the early plans, uh, there was a grand vision of India becoming a very modern, a very progressive state. But it didn't happen. The reason is not the kind of lack of effort of the planners, uh, the kind of scope that was reduced for planning successively. Now, where is planning? We have adopted some kind of programming or what I would like to say, even scheduling. We can compile number of projects and add up with some figures which will give you so many millions and billions. But that is not planning. Have we understood our own society first? Do we have a kind of social uh, agreement or consensus on the kind of society that we want to evolve? I don't think so. There is a kind of a rupture, there is a kind of disconnect and uh, the kind of social tensions which have been built in to this has created this situation. So first of all, to begin with, we will have to evolve a kind of a social understanding, a social a kind of a agreement or consensus on the key social issues. So what kind of society we want to build? We want a liberal society, fine. We want a society which is in harmony with each other, fine. Or we want a society which is always at loggerheads with each other. Even between the professionals and the politicians, do we have some agreement? So only those people who just say yes, 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 would get promotion. And the people who say facts and point out the right direction might get neglected. So we need to change the social environment. And that is beyond the planners. It is the responsibility of each and every citizen. So as a nation, as a people, we have to decide on these critical issues. Then we can adopt models of planning that we can evolve ourselves rather than importing a model or imposing a model on this society and this environment. We are not going to succeed. So as uh, the issue came up of micro and macro level kind of planning, it is also the bottom up versus top down kind of a planning and planning only for a certain economic sectors and planning for the complete economy is different. Right. So, so we need a kind of a societal transformation. And for this, I think the NGOs and the groups like yours are doing commendable job. And uh, you are continuing this tradition, which in spite of all the difficulty has continued. And we need to recognize this. Now, the kind of ideas that we require for bringing about this change which is also visible. Like, we need not wait for the big changes, hmm. uh, which might take right. maybe, uh, decades or maybe centuries, but we can also begin with small things. Yeah, you were talking about health issues. Uh, and I would suggest that, okay, if I provide a space for walking to my fellow citizens, will it not improve their health? It will. Like you are pointing out one square meter of open space. If we increase 
this to 1.5 or 2, will it not improve their health? It will. If you improve the green cover, it will also improve the health. So these are interconnected. Right. So where can we begin? We can begin with the smaller things, but we should not stop only at that. It's a kind of multi-pronged attack. Yes. The some of us will have to work at the macro level. Uh, we'll have to work at the state and the national level. We'll have to work at the international organizational level. At the same time, many of us will have to work at the grassroots level. Right, right. And right. there will have to be an open dialogue, transparency, and uh, kind of a collaboration. Absolutely. I think this yes. model, which pursues competition for individual economic growth, will have to be given up. Earlier we do it, better it is. We need to stop <laughs> okay. the societal model. Professor yes. Chauhan, you have elevated this discussion to a very philosophical one, I have to say. I, yes, I, I, I agree with you. I strongly believe without this. Yes. No, I agree with you. I agree with you. Common good is a very, very noble objective. And I think you have highlighted it very strong, very poignantly and very... asking for collaboration. Yes, like absolutely. Even having slightly different views from each other, yes, why can't yes. you collaborate on something which they agree? Yes, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And on that note, I will go back to Burgess, who actually, in the middle of all that we were raising, raised a very positive note and said things are not as bad as they look. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, Professor Chauhan said, let's, let's highlight what's happening and let's do the good. I want to ask you, there is a question from somebody who's watching our program saying, we know that the master plan of a city largely determines the built-up environment. How integrated is an institution like IGBC into the planning process? How is the green building movement actually doing? Burgess, that one's for you. Yeah, it's not really a question of new green reforms coming into the picture to begin with, quite frankly. Uh, it's quite complex to answer, but it has a lot to do with- You have four minutes to answer a complex question. It has a lot to do with how we've chosen to approach our stance at developing cities to begin with. And the biggest yeah. disaster has been a plot by plot approach for various projects. And you know, the segregation which Rajit and Akkas have already described. This was in fact a big mistake. And we have already worked on these sort of reformations in other states, where you know, through statutory guidelines and other prescriptive norms, which take into account how cities should look. Form-based approach and other st strategies are quite frankly the future of planning Indian cities. But if for a city like Mumbai, which is already this old. Green building norms will have to be absolutely, I mean, they cannot afford any liberal legroom because the entire green building movement itself has been called out for its trade-off based approach. Just because you do good in some categories for build green, uh, green buildings for getting a rating does not entitle one to ignore the other categories as well. So you have to have some sort of uh, basic, uh, I would say, you know, benchmarks or at least a holistic uh, accounting across all parameters of green buildings and just keep building on that rather than just getting a rating for the sake of you know qualifying in a certain few good criteria and getting it done so there needs to be a lot of more rigorous and you know command and control approaches for really calling out who's doing sustainable development and what and these green ratings just offer a medium to start they don't really have to be even followed as such if you know, basic criteria considered. And, you know, these are inherent to practice, or at least ethical practices to begin with. So perhaps the ratings are just a reflection of what directions had to be taken anyways. And we just need to build up on that now and explore what new fabrics for cities can look like. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very cognizant of the time. I know all of you uh, committed to 5 p.m. I'll just take a couple more minutes. Any... Uh, we promise to reach out to all of you because each of these topics promises stories for citizens, more exploration, more, you know, we have Radha, Aruna, Sachi, my colleagues from Bombay on the call. We would love to hear more about how we can learn more about these topics. But maybe a minute or a couple of minutes for each one of you to just share some, I don't even want to ask a question. Any, any thoughts, just a two minute, last minute thoughts. Yes, Professor Chauhan. I, I just want to bring up this issue of planning education. Uh, I think we don't have enough number of planners to manage our cities. Like in Mumbai, we don't have a, a, a good planning course, uh, which is not only physical planning, 
but uh, also socio-economic, environmental, I mean, uh, more uh, integrated planning. At the same time, uh, we have now uh, additional facility of urban designers. And yet, in most of our municipal uh, institutions, we don't incorporate them in good numbers. So we need to have positions for uh, planners and urban designers and landscape architects and environmental consultants in our municipal authorities. And we need to strengthen planning mechanism in the municipal authority, even at the ward level, because our wards are like cities in their own scale, you know? Absolutely. Take Malad and it would, the population would, of Malad would be more than 10 lakhs, you know? The great one city uh, kind of uh, structure that we have created. So we need to provide for this education. At the same time, a lot of state uh, efforts, funding and support should be there for research on all these issues, uh, which is not forthcoming as such. Thank you, thank you. I saw all of our panelists nodding when you said that. So clearly you've touched upon something that's uh, much uh, much needed in the sector. Rajit, your thoughts? I'll uh, go back to something you mentioned of, you know, the, the need to go for mayoral forms of governance. You know, I think that's something we've spoken about for decades before, and hopefully we're not talking about it for decades ahead. Uh, but, you know, rather than pursue a goal, which will take a lot of time to achieve, you know, where states are going to give up their power and devolve it to local uh, areas, uh, we should immediately at least go for ensuring certain good principles come in, into our cities, whether it's like, you know, Prachi was talking about how there's more participation now in planning. I think these kind of things we need to insist on. Uh, you know, concerns which Aslam has mentioned, in not going down to the communities that are actually living on the ground. We should push for better practices. Uh, planning can incorporate all of this through participatory methods, more sensitive, you know, ecologically sensitive design. I think we should push this into existing institutions and make them accountable. And platforms like yours uh, can help with that accountability. I think we should aim towards that than aiming for, you know, very long-term goals, which will take time to achieve. Small drops. Thank you. Thank you very much. Aslam? I think there should be an interface where uh, people, uh, they actually can meet the other people. There are no, uh, like in city in Mumbai, there are no uh, museums or galleries dedicated to the tribal art or Koli people. Basically, this is a Koli city. And we don't have such institute. We can't understand them. The people, it's not people's fault. We, they, they don't, they, they are invisible. The people have become invisible, the indigenous people. So we have our own identity, but we have become a, any other satellite city like Gurgao. Bombay has its history. Bombay has its, uh, there are like so many caves in Bombay. No other cities in the world have so many cave, rocket caves in Bombay. So, but we, we don't, uh, we don't, want to know this. So I think education is very important about all this. Thank you. Thank you. Burgess? I think it's the same as what I mentioned before and I actually spoke is the need for, you know, more citizen science database to be created and regularly updated. So I think that could give up planning a good match, especially in a city like Mumbai. So that is the first starting point that should be considered. And moving on from that, Whatever pillars the climate action plan are considered, maybe you can just streamline them into that for greater action. That's all. Great, thanks. We'll get back to you on that for sure. We definitely want in on that project. Prachi? Yeah, so um, uh, Akhtar Chauhan picked up my favorite line, which I keep hopping about in every forum that we don't have a planning school. Having said that, uh, the next one that he mentioned and which I really feel very strongly about is decentralized planning. Yes, our wards are equivalent to cities itself. C ward being the highest density in the world. If you may, uh, you know, get into the depth of it with less number of open spaces and, uh, you know, really high density. So we definitely need decentralized planning systems. And uh, one more uh, issue that I would like to point out that we all, we, we planners keep talking about, you know, how comprehensive the plan should be, you know, but it, that's extremely uh, a myth because institutionally we are not comprehensive. How are we going to make a comprehensive plan? 
and hence the pockets that you see of SRA or uh, Gautan areas, uh, airport authority, MBPT, they are all different pockets and hence uh, it is not a comprehensive plan. We will not be able to make that unless we are institutionally kind of comprehensive. Right. Thank you. I was going to sign off, but I quickly, some Aarti Agarwal has raised her hand. Uh, would you like to say something? Is it a question addressed to one of our resources? Sorry, if any of you is sort of has another commitment, feel free, feel free to drop off. Thank you so much. But if you have five minutes, please stay on. Aarti, did you have a question? Uh, say something and a question too. Since right. we have uh, you know, learned panelists, I as a common citizen, I'm facing issues daily when I go out to get the laws implemented in context to community animals, trees and all for the betterment of society. Now what happens is I have approached citizen matter, they take up the matter, the matter goes up to the CM level, PM level, the moment it comes to the DCP level, the matter is just, you know, made zero and we suffer as citizens. So what do the panelists have to say we can talk big things, but day to day, you know, society may be taking enough. So every CHS may this problem is going on. If the CHS is not, you know, uh, uh, improve nahi hui. So aap kitni bhi planning kar lijiye na to humein acha environment milega, na acha citizens milenge, na achi compassionate and empathetic setup milega. So ja that us level tak jaake aapke paas koi ideas hai to improve this thing. I think Prachi, she's kind of echoing what you're saying and what Professor Chauhan is saying that we need to go down to the absolute decentralized level and not have a helicopter or now drone approach saying, let us look at it from the top. But please, your thoughts, she's saying, unless you actually uh, resolve things at a CHS level. And I remember my sister saying that there were days when they were locked in because whatever MCGM rules, their society had more rules on top of that. So sorry, your thoughts, Prachi? No, absolutely. Ward or the Janasabhas that we've been talking about, uh, uh, the decentralized planning, of course, the, uh, uh, you know, the constitutional amendment uh, on decentralized planning has yeah. not really succeeded. But however, yes, ward level planning, ward level Janasabhas is the answer, which would also answer some of the questions that Aslam has raised here. Uh, the the fine grain solutions, the fine grain kind of uh, understanding of issues uh, in the society. Uh, we need to, uh, you know, put up up there. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. Actually, that could well be the topic of our next webinar saying, where are the ward committees? Why have we not yet sort of gotten there? And that except for, I think, Kerala and a couple of other states, it's the same state everywhere. We're not getting down to the ward committees, which will be crucial to local citizens' voices being heard. But for now, I want to say thank you very much. Uh, Rohit Lahoti says, just echoing that, ward level committees have been have done so well in Andhra Pradesh. Yes, thank you, Kerala too. And uh, we've also written extensively about why we don't have enough uh, of that activity here in uh, Tamil Nadu as well. Um, we are actually having councillor elections after 10 years. For five years, we've not even had councillors. So yeah, we have these issues everywhere. Uh, please feel free to write to us, mumbai at citizenmatters.in. I want to thank every one of you panelists for coming and sharing your experiences with us. Between this five of you, there is a wealth of experience here that comes through, that shines through your love for the city as well. Thank you so much for joining us. We will reach out to you occasionally now and then for voices and expertise when we are writing articles. Uh, please continue to be a resource and a guiding light for us. Thank you once again and have a very good evening. Thank you, Minakshi. Thank you.